Thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on our second episode of Grow Show. It has been a really busy week since our first episode. Can you believe that last week we have had over 4,000 viewers? It's just gone to 4,010 viewers now in the last 10 minutes, and it's all thanks to you guys. Uh, Grow Show is all about giving you actionable tools and techniques that allow you to make a difference in your business in these extraordinary times, but we genuinely couldn't do it without you. And this episode is packed full of things that you will apply and employ straight away, I promise you. So without further ado, let's get on with Grow Show. If you haven't seen me speak before, let me introduce myself. My name is David Mead. I'm a keynote speaker and my primary career was always as a researcher into the characteristics of high performing teams, organizations and individuals. I look at the proven science of how to grow your business, grow your team and grow yourself. And in every single episode of Grow Show, I'm going to show you real things that you can apply and employ immediately to make a difference inside your business, to meaningfully move the needle on your team's performance. And Grow Show is all about making sure that we are staying interactive. So throughout the session, if you have questions, if you have comments, if you have feedback, please do put them inside the box below. We are going out, out live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and on LinkedIn, of course, which is our favorite platform of them all. So we want to hear from you because the show really is not the same without you. So let's go to the comments right now and see who do we have. We have got uh, Adam Paris is coming in from our friends at Balfour Beatty. Adam, say a big hello to all of the team from me. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got Janet is a Grow Show groupie. Janet, it's lovely to see you. Good taste in glasses. You're like my sister from another minute, uh, uh, from another uh, sister, from another mister. Uh, we've got uh, Gillian coming in from the lovely team at Devonish. Gillian, I hope you're all keeping well. John Small is coming in and thank you so much for uh, looking forward to today's events. We've got people from all across. Um, we've even got people, uh, we've got Frank coming in and saying he's looking forward to today's event event as well. So thanks for taking the time to join us. It really is your interactivity that makes this show come alive. So if you have questions, comments or feedback throughout, please do let me know. And I want to encourage you to do this as much as possible. So just like last episode, we are giving away some Grow Show swag. And again, I'll be honest, it's not great. It's pretty low quality, but it's free. So if you'd like to get some free swag, then throughout the episode, leave a comment of any kind below or even better, tag a friend or a colleague who you think might learn something from the psychological tools and techniques that I will be sharing. Or even better, if you could share the video to your feed, whether you're watching on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, these are the terms and conditions for the competition. And I am duty bound to say that it is not in any way affiliated with Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Twitter. So go and see the terms and conditions there if you like, and we will be picking someone to win the great content, uh, that great little freebie by the end of the episode. And as I promised, this episode is on leadership. How do we achieve discretionary effort in the team around us? How do we encourage them to meaningfully deliver their best work? When they are have the opportunity to do their best work for their teams, for your customers, clients, leads, and prospects, do they actually do it? Do they deliver that 1%, 3%, 5% that makes life easier for the people around them and more profitable for you? And in this climate and in this moment, it's really important that we invest in leadership because the world has fundamentally changed. As difficult as it was six months ago to lead our team, it is ever more tough today because we need to inspire them through these virtual spaces. We need to encourage them to meaningfully deliver their best work. And it is really tough in times like this. And the statistics bear this out because before lockdown, and remember, these are the statistics before the coronavirus, we know that 85% of employees employees, the best research shows us, are not engaged. This is a huge problem when you think about it, but worse than that, 81% of your team, your colleagues right now, are considering leaving the organization. 
Now, if 81% of your organization are considering leaving, think about the lost experience that you get, the lost expertise, the lost client relationships. And if we get this right as leaders, if we really invest in the people around us, if we make sure that we are listening to them and continuing to encourage them to challenge and stretch themselves to achieve more, then you can achieve about 700% more revenue. So it's so important that we appreciate there is a business case for getting this right. But I want to go back to this 85% because this is terrifying when you think about it. We might be in the midst of a global pandemic, but this is a workplace epidemic. Imagine 85% of anything inside your organization was not working. You'd immediately do something about it. But because this is our people, it's sort of okay. If you worked in the travel industry and 85% of your transport didn't arrive on time, you'd immediately do something about it. If you worked in the food space, and 85% of your dishes came back every single week, you would immediately take remedial action. If you worked in IT and 85% of your laptops got sent back every time you sold one, you would fix it right away. If 85% of your brain cells don't work, then consider a career in politics. You might do surprisingly well. The point is that we need to accept that leadership is simpler than we think, but it does take effort and it does take intention. And a little bit later in this episode, I will tell you about an outstanding leader, not one that you've ever heard of before, not a politician, not a famous business person or a sports person, a leader who, using simple language tools, got me to do things in my job that at the start I thought I didn't want to do. But when I was actively involved in them, I actually really enjoyed it. And even though it was a task that I definitely wanted to resist, by the end, I even felt great about it. So I'll tell you more about that guy later. But we need to accept that when we're asking our people to, to do their best work, you can look at two employees who are on the same desk, on the same pay scale, looking out the same window, but for some reason performing dramatically differently. What is it that separates them? And every time I think about this challenge, I'm reminded about this this meme that I'm sure some of you will have seen. These two handsome, bearded, red-headed gentlemen are entirely unrelated, not familiarly, their parents have never met before, which is what their dad said, but they are identical, even though they have no DNA connection whatsoever. And they ended up sitting side by side on a Ryanair flight a few years ago. It was a stunning coincidence. But even though they look identical, they're fundamentally different individuals. And it's exactly the same with our team as well. Same pay scale, same challenges, same customers and same products, and some of them are performing fundamentally differently. As delighted as these two guys seem, I think my favorite guy is the one in the back. Look at his smiley little cheery face. I can tell this is easily one of the top three days of his life so far. And while outwardly he looks very happy and pleased, I sense quite a lot of darkness in his soul. Anyway, we know that when we talk to people about what it is that inspires and motivates them, what it is that encourages them to do their best work, all the evidence proves that there are some things that are fairly predictable when it comes to conversations. We like to think that it's salary that does it. It's sal because I know money is delicious. I'm a big fan. We like to think that maybe it's workplace competition that inspires us to do better results, maybe fear of punishment or fear of failure of some kind. These are the ones that we always say push us to do better work, but actually the research proves that nothing could be further from the truth. If you really want to get people to achieve discretionary effort, if you want to be a leader that people want to do things for, then you have to build autonomy into their role. They have to feel and believe like the work that they're doing is doing something, creating something. It has to have meaning. They need to feel a sense of belonging. They need to feel like they have active co-authorship, like they are contributing not just to the bottom line of your business, but to where the organization is going, to the overall impact. If you don't have that, you'll be slowing down every single day. So how do we do it? Well, the first step is as leaders, we need to stop and take check for a moment and try and see the world from their perspective. So easy it is for us to say that, oh, well, their job is not too hard and their salary is fine. They get to work from home, sit in a hot tub on the laptop at the moment but we never really take time to see their role, their challenges and their opportunities from their perspective. Because as a leader, we can look at the same scenario as one of our team members and see it in a fundamentally different way if we're not careful. And I can show you this with a really simple illusion. I want all of you as you watch now, 
I want you to take a moment to watch this little video clip and decide inside your head, is this train traveling into the tunnel or out of the tunnel? Which is it? Leave a little comment. As a general rule, when I play this at live events, half of the audience say the train is traveling into the tunnel and half of the audience say it's traveling out of the tunnel. The truth is actually, neither of those things are true. It's two images that are simply alternated back and forth, back and forth, but our brain is telling us that we need to make a decision. And even though many of us, and we've got a couple of hundred people watching live across all of the channels now, even though we are looking at exactly the same scenario and situation, Situation, we're seeing it in fundamentally different ways. Let me know inside the comments. Are you seeing it go into the tunnel or are you seeing it come out of the tunnel? Now, there are loads of ways that I can bring these perspective tools alive. So let me show you another little great way of bringing it alive. I'm going to bring in a second camera here just so um, we can see. Oh, we'll come back to that in a little moment. And I'm um, great to see so many comments here coming in. We've got Glenn. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us on the line. It's lovely to have you here. Um, Aidan is saying that he saw it go into the tunnel. Thank you for the feedback. And um, Janet saw it going into the tunnel as well. But Karen saw it going out. And remember, folks, we're seeing exactly the same thing. The only thing that's shifting is the way that we see it. Now, Damien is seeing it shift back and forth. It's very rare, Damien, that people can see both of those. Our job is to make sure that we understand our team well enough that we can see it from their perspective. But if we want to get the best loyalty and results from them, we also have to ask tough questions because it is our job to build engagement, no one else's. It is our job to build commitment and it's our job to build loyalty too. And loyalty really matters. Few people know more about the subject of workplace loyalty than celebrated philosopher Dwight Schrute. Would I ever leave this company? Look, I'm all about loyalty. In fact, I feel like part of what I'm getting paid for here is my loyalty. But if there were somewhere else that valued that loyalty more highly, I'm going wherever they value loyalty the most. Oh, one of my favorite quotes of all time. If you haven't seen The American Office, I can assure you it's like a reality show for most of the businesses that I've worked in through time. And here, this was the Halloween episode, by the way. It was a great episode. And as you can see, in this episode, Dwight was dressed as a head of procurement. Anyway, when it comes to building loyalty, there are some really simple uh, tools and techniques that you can do. Now, I know these days that people say that, oh, well, if I want to get the best results from my people, then I need to work on their side salary first, don't I? I can assure you the the, the performance of your team can be massively built, increased and improved without any performance related pay, without any ratcheted bonus schemes. The things that really move the needle on their performance are much simpler than you think. And I can prove it with some experiments using origami, word searches and Lego. And not a single one of them have really got money at their core and I'll prove it. So let's go to the first experiment. And this, uh, there are three different versions of this that we're going to look at. And you have my word by the time this this finishes, you'll be able to use these immediately and straight away. Now, you know that your salary on day one in your new role was fantastic. You were happy with it. You were delighted with it. But six months in, you were probably a little less happy. And 12 months in, even significantly less happy. And maybe two or three years in, you would be hugely disappointed and maybe even irritated at the size of your salary. So some researchers decided to test that decreasing satisfaction that we have with our salary with a really easy study. Participate participants were asked to build Lego figures. The first one they got $3 for and everyone after that they got paid successively less. They wanted to see how many people would build, uh, sorry, how many uh, Lego figures each participant would, bu was, would build. They were divided into two groups. One group, when they built their little Lego figures, the piece was held for a while and then dismantled. In the second group, their piece was immediately dismantled. Now, I want to be clear about this. They were both getting exactly the same financial reward. They were both also getting the Lego figures dismantled at the end. They both knew that, that they would be torn apart. But one was held for a little while and one was dismantled immediately. Now, the impact of this was really huge. The group whose Lego figures were held, even just for a little while, on average, they built around 11 Lego figures. However, those who were dismantled straight away only built seven, even though they were getting exactly the same financial reward, even though it was the same circumstances. The sense that this piece of work was being held and valued even for a brief moment before it was dismantled meant that they did significantly more better work. 
But the question is, how do we create that sense of value in our workplace? Another version of this study involved word searches. Participants were given a page full of words and they needed to find pairs of letters. If they did that, then they were successful and they got a certain financial amount. Every time that they did it, they got decreasingly less and less reward for taking part in the study. So what impact did it have when they were divided into three groups? One group was asked to put their name on the page, submit it to the researcher. The researcher would look at it, mark it, and then file it away carefully. That was group number one. Group number two did not put their name on the page. When they submitted it, the researcher did not look at it. He simply put it into a pile, thereby making their work essentially anonymous. In group number three, their work the moment that it was submitted, it was shredded immediately. So there was no name on it and it was not even observed. Now bearing in mind, they had exactly the same financial reward structure irregardless of what group they were in. And the impact of it was staggering. We know that people whose work was shredded needed twice as much money as those whose work was being acknowledged. Now that's not terribly surprising. However, it's the middle group that I really want you to pay attention to. People in the second group whose work was saved but ignored when they didn't have their name on it, it just went into the pile, needed almost exactly as much. I suppose what I'm saying here is if you're not taking time to recognize every single effort, contribution and submission that your team put in, you are essentially having exactly the same impact as if you shred it in front of their eyes. The third one is probably the most interesting of all. Uh, researchers gave some origami novices instructions to build an intentionally ugly, pathetic origami piece that no one would ever want. And there were two groups. Half of the people actually made this ugly piece of origami. The other half simply watched the group that were making it. However, in a second trial, they weren't given any instructions, so they really needed to struggle to make this. This meant that they were much slower at making the item, number one, but also number two, they were significantly more ugly, as if that could even be possible. The results were absolutely breathtaking, and they have real lessons for the way that you lead your team today. In the first experiment, the people who built the item, in other words, they contributed something to it, they had some co-authorship, they were willing to pay 500% more than the bystanders. That's exactly the same item and they watched it be built. They know what it is, they know what it costs, they all know how much effort went in. But when someone is actively involved in doing it, it means so much more to them than just watching something happen. So this is a really strong message. It doesn't matter how small or big the jobs that you and your team are doing every day. It's part of them. It's part of who they are. They feel connected to it. That's why we must recognize and reward it. In the second, lack of instructions meant that builders had a significantly more ugly, but also a significantly more difficult to build piece. But because they struggled more with it, because they worked harder on it, they actually valued it as a builder significantly more. But the bystanders valued it significantly less. The lessons for this are so obvious for the way that you lead your team today. Our valuation of our own work is directly tied to the amount of effort that we personally expended on it. If we feel like we've got co-authorship, if we feel like we've got autonomy, if we feel like we put something of ourselves into it, then we value it a lot more. And if the people around us, whether it's our colleagues or whether it's our leader, don't ascribe it that same value, it is hideous. It's an awful thing that happens to us. It cuts through our core and it compromises how connected we feel to that work. So look, what is the upshot of this? Because it is important that we take this into account. Look, there are loads of versions of these studies. These are just one that I found. But if you were to do a little Google, you would find hundreds of different interpretations and replications of the studies. But our people need to feel meaning and output in their efforts. If you work on a document, if you work on a submission, if you work on a project and submit it into your organization and get no recognition for it whatsoever, you feel devalued as a human being. And not only that, you feel less of a contributor to the organization. But think to the study in the word searches where people's name was taken off the work. Nothing 
nothing hurts more than having your work taken away from you and given as someone else's. Let's say you work a long time on a document. Maybe it's about culture and values. Maybe you submit it into the organization. Someone takes that from you, puts their name on it. This cuts through the core of who we are. We need to feel like the work that we're doing is being recognized, reward and rewarded and celebrated. So here's a simple equation I want you to take away because everybody loves an equation. Effort minus purpose. In other words, effort without the sense that what I'm doing matters equals resentment, but effort with purpose equals contentment. These things don't cost a single penny. They don't cost a cent. They are so easy to apply and employ straight away. The fact is, as leaders, our job is to widen the sphere within which our people perform. So let me put this video just back to the start so you can see it. Because as human beings, we live up to and down to our expectation of ourselves. If we don't constantly reward, recognize, and thank and display gratitude for the people around us, then all that does is shrink their effort, shrink their ambition, and shrink their results. Um, people live up to and down to their own ambition and expectation of themselves. Our job as leaders is to widen this, not to shrink it. I love this little experiment. It's been carried out so many times now. Every single time the circle gets smaller and smaller, the ant always stays in the middle. The last time I did this personally, nine circles and the ant still stayed in the middle and the ant died in the last circle. It was hilarious. Only joking, I can assure you the ant is absolutely fine. The ant is fine living on a farm just outside Northern Ireland. So how do you apply this? Well, the first thing I need you to take away, it is not about performance related pay. It's not about a ratcheted bonus scheme. If a person, like in those three experiments that we've just talked about, if they feel connected to the work that they're doing, if they feel like their work has an output and an impact, they will truly work harder and longer and in a more connected and dedicated way for less salary. And my, my, my job in telling you this is not to reduce your salaries. It's instead to show you that if you really want to keep people, if you want to engage them, if you want them to deliver their best work, it is simple. Just recognize them. Just reward their work with some gratitude. Sometimes that gratitude can be public and it can be private. And one best example of this goes all the way back to one of my first ever jobs. One of my first leaders was a guy called Daniel Donahue. Now, I don't know about you. If you've ever worked in the hospitality industry, I think it is the best hotbed of great leadership. And the hospitality industry is a really tough gig. I remember I hadn't been off for six weeks solid. I had worked every single day. And on my first day off, I was lying in bed. And at 10 past 11, my mobile phone rang in Washington, DC. It was Dan. The box compactor at the back of the hotel was blocked. So in other words, people had put too much cardboard into it. And as a consequence, it simply wasn't working. It wouldn't squash the boxes. If you've ever used one of these devices before, you'll know the only way to fix that is to physically crawl inside this dangerous, murderous device, pull out the boxes, jump up and down on them until they get squashed and put them back in. I didn't want to do this. I was exhausted. I had worked every single day. And if I was going to come into work, I certainly didn't want to come in to do a job like this. He called me up and he said, David, you're the only person that can do this. You're the only person that I can trust. David, if you're not able to do this for me today, no one can. And I talked to him on and off for five minutes. And I said, Daniel, no, under no circumstances. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. I need a rest. Anyway, cut to 46 minutes later and I'm in the bottom of that machine jumping up and down in about four inches of garbage liquid and I could feel a little pitter-patter of, I'm not sure what, cockroaches, rats, mice, who knows, but the reason I was there is that he recognized the work that I do. He gave pre-gratitude for work that I hadn't even done yet. He made me feel good about doing a job that, frankly, I didn't want to do. And more importantly, while I was inside dancing up and down on the boxes, I remember thinking that for him, I would have done this any day of the week because he had built that relationship with me. Our relationship with our team is like a bank account. Every time you recognize them, and I'm not talking about financially, every time you recognize some discretionary effort that they've done. You're making a little deposit on that bank when you can recall on it and draw upon it again at some point in the future that you need to. 
So the question I want you to ask yourselves today is, on your team, who would jump into a skip or clean out a dumpster for you on a day off? That's question number one I need you to ask. But question number two is, who that you have been led by would you be willing to do that for? Would you be willing to jump up and down in wet, sweaty, pooly, a pool of garbage mess? Because if you're not sure of the answer to those questions, then you need to spend this afternoon asking some really big questions about how you can build that sense of connection, that sense of reciprocity, that sense of co-authorship with your team, because nothing matters more. So look, I hope you will take away those three pieces of research. They are really simple. They are really easy. And remember, they don't cost a single penny to get this result from your team. So let's go over to the comments now. Let's see who we have coming in. We have got... Uh, uh, Katie Nolan coming in from Washington, D.C. Katie, it is lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us. Peter, thank you for uh, joining us for another live as well. It's great to see your name here as well. Uh, loads of uh, great feedback. Uh, Paul, let's see, Paul is coming in and saying, great studies. Also love and inspired by the work of Desi and Ryan, the self-determination theory. Absolutely. They truly believe that when we set our ambitions, it has a huge impact on our results. Uh, these are great studies. Where can I find these? Uh, Craig, if you just Google them, they come up. But uh, books by Dan Ariely and Dan Pink have them. And um, uh, so there are loads of examples. If you just give them a quick Google, you can find them. Genuinely fascinating. Um, so Peter is saying that a goal should be to make Make folk feel useful, appreciated, and needed. Uh, it will lead to motivation and loyalty. Peter, I couldn't agree more. When a person feels like they are meaningfully connected to the work that they're doing, think back to that Lego study that I described earlier. There were two groups. Both of them were making Lego characters. One Lego character was held for a little while and dismantled. The other one was dismantled straight away. Just the process of holding on to it for a little while, it created a connection of purpose. Uh, Paula is saying a simple thing thank you or well done goes a long way. You are so right, Paula. Now, the only challenge is making the time to do it. I know how incredibly we all are at the minute. We've got Jonathan coming in at the minute from the Excel. What a great, great, great business. I've loved spending time with you. Uh, Emma has said in and out of the tunnel, depending on how I looked at it. I'm impressed, uh, Emma. Not many people can see both. Uh, who have we got? Uh, Jamie says a thank you goes so far. It does, Jamie. And Jamie is an event professional. And I can assure you, nothing matters more in the event industry in this climate than a good thank you. Uh, who have we got? Andrew McQuillan says, it will be great to use these on contractors who interact with staff on job locations. We rely on them doing some things to allow us to get our work completed. So true, Andrew. It creates a collaborative relationship that you can draw upon for many years. Sean Quinn is saying, you've hit the nail on the head regarding acknowledging your team. And Sean, it is so easy to forget to do it. Now, what I will say is when I'm talking about acknowledging your team, I'm not necessarily just send them a text to say thank you or a BCC email where you connect with everyone in the business. Try if you can to connect to everyone one to one. Even if it's virtually like this over Zoom, the impact that it can make a long way. We've also got Russell is coming in and saying authenticity has to go along with this appreciation. I mean, absolutely, Russell. I couldn't agree more. The leader who willy nilly sends out an email or a text message every week to say thank you for all of your hard work that loses its meaning. It loses its intentionality and it loses its impact. A real leader knows and understands every member of their team and knows how to connect to them. Some team members like the public appreciation. However, some other team members like quiet appreciation. A good leader's job is the one to make sure uh, to know what it is that inspires their best work. Sinead says, I had a boss who said well done frequently, but it was meaningless. You're right. If they're saying the same thing over and over again, it starts to lose its potency. I remember years ago when Karen Doherty and I were writing our TV shows in Starbucks. I went up to the counter, ordered a couple of coffees, and one of the ladies behind the counter said, oh, hey, uh, what are you doing for the rest of the day? And I thought, gosh, this is really friendly. We had a quick banter back and forth about what my plans were for the rest of the day, and I sat down and thought, gosh, she was really lovely. I think I'll go on to TripAdvisor. And as Kieran and I sat there writing our TV show, we heard her ask it 11 more times. She had clearly just listened to a webinar on customer services, but it lost its authenticity. So uh, Julie is saying, 
amazing. My team are amazing. Need to tell them more, but I do try. Julie, your team are amazing, and you're pretty uh, rock solid. Uh, uh, you're a bit of a rock star yourself. Um, so, folks, uh, Damien Do uh, Donnelly is also saying thank you for sharing. No worries. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Now, I did say at the very beginning that um, this episode, these episodes are going to be coming out every single week, and they are. Our next one is on the real science of mindset. How do you improve the way that you approach the challenges and opportunities that land on your desk every single day. Now make sure that you put these times inside your diary every Wednesday, 3 p.m. in the UK, 10 a.m. Eastern, and these are all of the rest of the times. And make sure that you don't miss an episode by, uh, if you want to get all of the recordings that you have missed, if you put any comment of any kind below, I'll send you a link where you can see all of the episodes that you haven't seen. Don't forget to click the follow button on LinkedIn. That will make sure that you get a notification for the next episode. If you're watching us now on YouTube, click subscribe and ring that bell so you get a notification to your mobile device when we go live and click like on Facebook as well. I said at the very beginning that I wanted to incentivize you for your chat. So I hope that you will take some time to tag in friends and colleagues who might enjoy Grow Show, who might take something away from it. I know some of our clients are sending the link out to their entire workforce. So I would love it if you would consider doing the same thing. So let's pick someone randomly now I'm going to look away. I'm going to pick someone randomly from the comments and it is going to ah, Paula Dent. Paula, drop me a little DM on LinkedIn, please. And you can get to pick what would you like? A ceramic mug, a flask or an insulated coffee cup. Paula, thank you for joining us. And thanks to everyone for taking the time uh, to join us. And if you are hosting your own virtual event for your team, then drop me a line. In the net last few weeks, I've hosted interactive team learning and development masterclasses for all of these businesses. They are bespoke to your business challenges and opportunities. And I would love to have the opportunity to work with you on the psychology of high performance in challenging times. So thanks to everyone for tuning into this episode of Grow Show. Remember, next week we are looking at mindset. So for now, I'm going to say thank you so much and I'll see you next time on Grow Show.